Uh, about four years ago, I was given the opportunity to teach a course here. And before I go on to say anything else about committing, not committing, anything like that, I will a piece of advice. If you're ever given the opportunity to come to a place like this and to teach and exchange ideas with young people in school, whatever else you're doing, just do it. Just say yes. Don't even think about it. It's a phenomenal experience and one which, regardless of where it goes, I am always going to cherish. Now, the course that I was asked to teach was something called Entrepreneurship and Biotechnology, which has a, has a kind of simple ambition and a more grand ambition. The simple ambition was to give the vocabulary and language of the business world to scientists and engineers and humanities students who normally wouldn't speak with that language, just to kind of give them a, a, a comfort with it, uh, make them more fluent in something they probably hear about but don't feel at home in. The more ambitious uh, approach that I took to the course, which I really talk too much about, is I wanted to give these students the feeling, the kind of innate in their DNA feeling, that as they come up with really good ideas, that they can take those ideas and make them tangible, make them something that helps people and really solves people's problems and makes them matter. And they could do it by themselves and under their own terms, rather than having to say, okay, well, I'm the idea person and I have to hand it off to someone else to grow and administer it. So from those uh, humble ambitions, Biotechnology 4180 was formed. Now, I had been out of academics for 20, 25 years by the time I started teaching a few years ago. And you learn new things, or you relearn new things. And one of the things that I encountered for the first time in decades was office hours. So the Tuesdays from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock in the afternoon in this little tiny half of a half of a closet that they gave me for an office that had a shelf with the microwave on it, and people would come in and cook their lunches while I was speaking to the students, I would hold office hours. And the, the first day, opened the door to the office, and there's a little line of students, some with drop ad forms to sign, but some who really wanted to talk. And taking my cue from uh, office hours I'd gone through when I was an undergraduate, I asked one student in at a time, sit them down and ask the student, you know, before we get to your specific question, tell me a little bit about yourself. So you got either kind of an icebreaker or just give me a bit of a perspective. And a horrible, horrible, awful, depressing transformation happened consistently with these interactions. Into the door would come a bright, enthusiastic, yeah, filled with energy and knowledge and ambitious student would sit down and I would say, tell me something about yourself. And out would come an incredibly boring, mundane, commodified, unimaginative description of how the student decided to present him or herself to me. If it was a long-winded description, it would usually include where they were from and grew up. There was one semester, everybody was from central New Jersey. That was particularly depressing. Uh, oftentimes, it was a very short sentence, and sometimes it was one word. This is my major. I am a biology major. I'm a sustainable development major, an economics major, an engineering major. I'm in this school, that school. Which is not to denigrate those disciplines or those fields, but it's to say it's a pretty narrow way of looking at yourself. So after a few weeks, I said, I've had enough of this. And I got to class, the third or fourth or fifth week of class, stood in front and I said, okay, we've got a pronouncement to make here. One of these hear ye, hear ye moments. From this moment in the class, we are banishing the concept of the college major. You are not allowed to consider yourself having a major. You are, you are all on an equal playing field. I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to hear any limitations about that. I don't want you to think it. Kind of a harsh thing to say. Uh, I did say if you feel the need to insert something else as your academic identity, I want you to all think of yourself as problem solvers. If you're going to graduate with a major, that's your major. You're a problem solver. And then, over the coming weeks, we expanded that definition a little bit. Say, so, okay, you're a problem solver, but you're, each of you is a special problem solver. There's no such thing as generic problem solving. You know, what is problem solving? Well, it's asking the right questions, gathering data, 
coming up with conclusions, and then effectively communicating your work. That's problem solving. But to this platform of problem solving, each student and each individual brings a different menu of competencies and different languages. What do I mean by languages? Yes, yeah, some speak Spanish, French, Mandarin, English. But you speak quantitatively. You speak qualitatively. If you speak qualitatively, you may speak in an expository way. You may speak in a, quant in a uh, descriptive way. Quantitatively, you may use numbers. You may use calculus. People throw off terms like, oh, it's a second derivative type problem. And they convey something if the person they're talking to knows what they're saying. Some people speak with graphs. Some people speak with science. It could be natural science, applied science, engineering, or medicine. These are all different layers of communication, layers of problem solving that you make into the you that is you, the problem solver. That's that much more than you, the biology major. So in the class, we described and we explored what is entrepreneurship. And in a very simple way of looking at it, is entrepreneurship is just the starting and nurturing of a company, of a business. But we tried to expand that. And my favorite definition of entrepreneurship is actually, it's the expression of creativity in a business setting. What's a business setting? Well, a business setting is a setting where one group of people solves the problems of another group of people. Now, I see a few rolled eyes out there, and there's some people saying, well, that's a pretty idealistic way to describe it. But hey, it is a TED talk, right? So if we're trying to expand and really define our definition of entrepreneurship. We, we talked about the, the obvious case studies. We talked about in biotechnology, coming up with an idea in a laboratory, then testing it in animals, testing it in human beings, and then 10, 12, or 15 years later, having a drug that relieves suffering, cures the sick, and prevents death. Great things. In technology, we talked about different ways that information can be disseminated, making the world a more efficient place. We talked about phone apps. We talked about why Apple computers were different than PCs. We talked about that silly movie that came out a few years ago about Facebook endlessly. But we also talked about creative processes. We talked about Dave Brubeck, the jazz musician, who in the 1950s went off to the Middle East and became enchanted with different rhythms and different time signatures of music, came back to New York and told the people at Columbia Records that he wanted to do a jazz album based on these alternative time signatures. And Columbia Records executives being the open-minded people that they are said, no way, no one's going to care, no one's going to buy it, don't do it. And finally, after a couple of years of convincing, recording it, recording the album, it's called Time Out. The Latin studies still to this day one of the greatest selling jazz records of all time. If you don't graduate, you graduate from Columbia without listening to that album, you're doing yourself a great disfavor. It's wonderful music. We talked about impressionism and how that arose in the uh, the 1800s. We talked about how impressionism was borrowed by realists like Thomas Eakins down in Philadelphia, who used a combination of his realism and impressionism to create these enormous, beautiful canvases. Some of which were things like operating rooms. One of which stands over the hallway at the University of Pennsylvania Medical School that I used to walk by every every morning and stop for a minute and just go, wow, 120 years after he painted it. Uh, so the, uh, the, we talked about, yeah, you think about someone like George Carlin. George Carlin was a comedian, for those of you who don't know, he died just a few years ago, probably one of the most important social critics and comedians of the second half of the 20th century. What did he, what was the basis of his comedy? What did he have people rolling in the aisles for? He was so funny and also very witty. He talked about grammar. He talked about word usage. And he managed to make it really, really funny. There's a tremendous amount of creativity that went into what he did. So when we banned the discussion of majors, when we talked about entrepreneurship as a means of connecting on many different levels and as a means of using your own creative instincts to bring about change and to add and layer on on top of your own good ideas, I got a lot of blank faces from my class. They sort of got it, they sort of didn't. It required a little bit of work. But we got there about halfway. I needed help. And the help came from an unexpected source. Now, in order to relieve the class of the tedium of having to listen to me talk for two hours, I used to cut the class in half. I would speak for an hour, 
And an hour for the second hour, I'd bring a guest speaker to come in and talk about what they did. In the first year, since it was entrepreneurship and biotechnology, the speakers were all from the biotechnology industry. Second year, third year, I started expanding it a little bit to get people that were in healthcare or people that were in business journalism. By the time of the fourth year, just anybody that had a really cool job and a good story to tell, I would bring in and talk to the class. And the stories were amazing. They were terrific. The setup was always the same. One chair on the stage, I'd leave, I'd ask one question, say, speaker, it's been X years since you were sitting over there and now you're here. Walk us through how you went from student in a classroom to where you are now. And the stories were phenomenal. We had, uh, oh God, Rich Gormley, a theology student turned biotechnology investment banker. We had Michelle Dipp who traveled from Western Texas to Oxford University in England studying to be a surgeon spent a little bit of time with the Wellcome Trust and is now the CEO of a very important biotech company in Boston looking at uh, revolutionizing reproductive medicine. We have Columbia's own Nina Tandon, who after a little bit of brownie in motion in her academic and career life, is the founder of a great company that does very precision modeling of replacement bone outside the body. We have Columbia graduate Heidi Moore, who went from being a pre-med, graduated, was writing speeches for uh, candidates out on the stump in the field very effectively, slid over into business journalism at the Wall Street Journal, moved from there to broadcast journalism at NPR, and is now the executive economics editor for The Guardian. 36 people over four years, all of whom are telling incredible stories and you can just see by the energy coming out of them, they love what they do, they're making a difference, they've got these great lives. And the students are sitting there with this, wow, I can do that. There's no reason that 10 years from now I can't be the person sitting in that chair being as fulfilled and doing something as important, something as cool as that. So that was a great thing. To me though, over four years, like the students got to hear eight or nine of these speakers, over four years I heard all 36. And even someone as dense as me, some things start sinking in. Most important thing that sunk in from every one of these people's experience is that no one was doing what they thought they would be doing when they came out of school. Everyone's career path had veered off and bounced off the wall and somehow ricocheted around and landed in something really, really great that they hadn't anticipated. Very few of them were doing anything that had anything to do with what their college major was, which turned out to be a very unimportant part of what they did. What they had done, and this brings us around to our whole process and concept of commitment, is they had dismissed the concept of, dis of committing to a label or committing to a narrow career path. You know, it's one of the great ironies of, uh, of having a major and declaring schools and things like that is the further and further you go in your education, the more educated you become, the less capable you think and less qualified you feel to do anything. That really can't be what the founding fathers of Columbia University had in mind when they put this curriculum together. But what they did do is they committed to a process they committed to doing things well, doing things right, and very importantly, expanding that creative palette upon which they, that, that, that they drew from in their roles as problem solvers. So if they, each of these people, if they define themselves as a scientist, then it's like, okay, well, how can I be more of an artist? If they spoke mainly quantitatively, then they challenged themselves to speak qualitatively. You go back, you know, people, people would sit in my office, some of my students say, I'm not a good writer. I say, well, well, become one. It's not that difficult. Start writing an active voice, strip out all the adjectives and adverbs from what you write, and make all of your imagery concrete and seeable. And you will become a very, very good writer. It doesn't take that long. Similarly, I'm not a numbers person. I have no math ability. It may be true, but you can certainly draw a graph. Well, how can, I, how can I convey complex emotions in a graph? I'll tell you, draw a simple XY coordinate. Draw a, parabol a parabolic line going up from the origin. Something showing you like this. Along the Y axis, put a T. That stands for time. 
So you, a long time, what it is we're measuring goes like this. Along the x-axis, put a heart. You can pretty well convey some fairly complex things with a graph. Expand the palette that you use, the, the, the things that you can draw upon. If you don't know science in a deep, dissect the mouse in the lab sort of way, learn it in a conceptual way. There's some, you, know, you go walk into a bookstore, go to the science section, there's some brilliant people who write about science as science as the cool thing. Math as a great thing to know about, a great thing to be able to converse in. Expand your palette, reject being narrow. Commit to things that broaden the means by which you can make yourself matter and you can be important. And uh, on that note, I will thank you.